I just give her the stanza yesterday. She just took it home and she came. She did it. It back. It's not time for the uh, sermon. If you have the Holy Bible, we open up the song. Let us stand up on our feet and welcome our Reverend, Reverend Theo Phyllis Lambo. Summer reading for this morning will be coming from the book of Second Timothy, chapter 3, from verses 1 to 17. Second Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. But realize this that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, mm -hmm. boastful, mm -hmm. arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unholy, mm -hmm. unloving, unconsciable, malicious gossips, mm -hmm. without self-control, brutal haters of God, treacherous, reckless, considered, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Only to a form of godliness, although they have denied his power, avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as James and Jemres opposed Moses, so these men who oppose the truth, men of deprived mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all. Just as James and Jebus folly was also. Now, you follow my teaching. Conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance persecutions, and suffering. So that's happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endure, and out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Mm -hmm. Amen. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But even men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be adequate it keep for every good work. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The theme for this morning is something that is very, very popular with you guys. Mm -hmm. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I may not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. 
as being found in Psalm 119, verse 11. When I was meditating on the message that the Lord has for us this morning, as I was looking through some pictures, I saw in one of the pictures a caption which reads, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. I read this statement again, and the more I read it, the more I recall, the several occasions my late father sat me down, talked to me, and impressed it in my heart that, son, if you follow my advice, it will be well with you. My earthly father has gone back home now, and I'm also not a young man anymore, but I still have a father above all fathers, and that is our father who are in hell. When the psalmist, King David, was writing this sentence in Psalm 119, 11, whose word was he referring to other than our God? Thy word, O Lord. Many things started filtering into my heart and brain that I nearly burst into excitement when all of a sudden I saw like a scroll of about a mile long all containing God's words to us to guide our footsteps through the raging waves storms and hurricane of life that could debar us from gaining eternal glory. The first thing that came to my mind was the contents of the church previous responsive reading. Each time we read it. I got a feeling I was committing myself more and more to God and making promises to Him which I know I must have to keep otherwise I would have been passing judgment upon my head to go out of his presence and do otherwise. If I have revealed the implication of this fact of our personal commitment to God to keep faith with him to you, each time we read this proclamation, I am sure that not many here will be responding as this secret quote of allegiance was being read to us. I pick up my holy Bible to read it again in Proverbs 3, 1-8. And the captions on top of that chapter in my Bible summarize the contents with the following headings. One, grant mercy and truth upon the tablet of your heart. Write mercy and truth upon the tablet of your heart. The second one, trust in the Lord. The third one, honor him with thy substance. The fourth one, whom the Lord loves, he corrected. Amen. And lastly, happy is the man that finds wisdom. Amen. Glory. If we try and consider these five words of admonition from God, I am sure it will not be too difficult for us to fully appreciate and understand the message that God was conveying to us in our former responsive reading. Verse 1 of that golden chapter. The book of Proverbs read, My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandment. My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandment. We may ask ourselves, why do I have to stop my heart with this commandment? As a modern man may be inclined to ask, and don't you be surprised. God provided the answer immediately. For they will bring you many days of full life, peace, and prosperity. <coughs> I want to ask that these commandments did not come to us till after Moses was given the Ten Commandments. So how then were the great characters we read in the Bible managed to have personal relationship with God without all the commands? People like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, and lastly, like Joseph. We must understand there was never a time that God has never identified himself with all those who walk righteously and serve him in the spirit and in truth. In Genesis 17, 1-2, it reads, And when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. The Lord was with Abraham, 
that he changed his name to Abraham, father of many nations. Because Abraham walked righteously before God. Amen. He kept the faith and he was blessed abundantly. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. The population of the 12 children of Jacob, who otherwise is known as Israel, grew and God provided them with a leader to take care of their needs while in Egypt, who was Joseph. And he walked righteously and faithfully before God and man. Joseph, if you remember, was sold into slavery. He became his master's head servant and had to suffer imprisonment because of his refusal to betray his master. But God used the prison dungeon to prepare him for the greater responsibilities that was to come before Joseph. Joseph's loyalty and faithfulness to his master, Potiphar, made God to elevate him from his position of obscurity inside the jail to second in command to King Pharaoh of Egypt. The children of Israel grew and multiplied greatly in Egypt. And when it was time for God to move them to the land he promised Abraham, their great-grandfather, God raised up Moses and prepared him for the great task as the liberator of God's own people. Moses was thoroughly trained and prepared by a period of 80 years through various experiences of life. Moses was loyal and faithful to God, and his righteousness almost saw him to the promised land. But God did not forsake him, and through him, God sent down to us the Ten Commandments. Amen. 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 My son, don't forget my teaching, Amen. but let your heart keep my command. King David walked uprightly before God most of his life. And God overlooked some of his iniquities because he showed remorse and grieved over his sins and God forgave him. God made a covenant with him that he would bless him and establish his kingdom over Israel. And through his seed shall a great king sit on his throne. God assured King David that his son shall be God's son and he, God, will be his father. When God says yes, no man can say no. It is we humans who never keep our promises yes. and can easily betray our faith and trust whenever it suits our convenience. Mm -hmm. And that is why it is often said that human confidence is vanity. It is better to put your trust in the Lord than putting all your trust and confidence in human beings. You will be utterly disappointed. Despite the series of crises and hurricanes which shook the household of King David, his son Absalom staged a coup d'etat to overthrow him, but he had to abandon his throne and fled for his life. Absalom defiling his father's concubines before all Israel. And Absalom's brother, Adonijah, trying to usurp his father's throne by proclaiming himself successor to the throne while David was on his dying bed. God stood by David, and he too remained faithful to God, and he never was discouraged and forsook God, but grew stronger in his trust and love for God that when he finally brought the ark of the covenant to Jerusalem, he sang psalms of praise to God. As we read in 2 Samuel 22, 21 to 25, it reads, The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanliness of my hands, he has recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not acted wickedly against my God. For all his ordinances were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was blameless towards him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanliness before his eyes. How many of us can boldly say today that we are righteous before God and men? Do we really understand all it entails to be righteous? Our Lord Jesus Christ summed up righteousness in Mark 10, 19-21. You know the commandments? Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. 
in verse 21, looking at him, Jesus felt the love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Our Lord Jesus Christ explained this further. That it is not when you have sexual relationship with another that you commit adultery. But when you also entertain amorous feelings in your thoughts towards another, you have committed adultery in your thoughts. Amen. I am sure our Lord was not only referring to sexual amorous feelings towards another of the opposite gender alone. Since in these days there existed all forms of immoralities as we have today. Sexual relationships between members of the same gender and prostitution. I was once asked by some of my students while I was in the university this pertinent question, which I am sure are also of interest to you parents. My fiance and I have been dating now for over a year, and my parents love him. Will I and him be committing adultery or fornication if we have sex? I mean safe sex, since we love each other so much. In a parent student school meeting, a topic was raised how could we prevent unplanned or unwanted pregnancy or prevalence of teenage mothers and spread of HIV, AIDS, and other sexual transmitted diseases. At the end of the whole debate, and shocking views of some parents, it was generally agreed that young and unmarried women and men should endeavor to abstain from sex altogether and wait till they get married. Otherwise, before, because of the affluent and the type of civilization we are having today, where morality cannot even be found anymore in churches, they concluded. It is better to practice safe sex and leave the preaching to preachers. These are the big questions that are confronting many parents and society today. Gone are the days when virginity used to be a symbol of pride to any would be pride. Some moralists and including some church leaders are even now advocating for the adjustment of the writings of the Holy Bible to suit the thinking of modern society called civilized society, where it is no longer a thing of embarrassment seeing two people raising a family without any form of marriage ties, either traditional or by the church or civic through registry. They just want themselves on the street and started raising babies. And when the honey starts running dry, or becoming tasteless due to resultant responsibilities. The honeybee may run away looking for another honeycomb. And that is the harsh reality we find today. And what about two male genders applying for adoption of a baby girl or a baby boy? Since both males have been legally married as husband and wife. I saw an incident in people's court where two female genders wanted to raise a child. They agreed that the one playing the role of the, of the wife should pay a male prostitute to get pregnant. And the plan worked. After a year, the male prostitute became a born-again Christian and realized that he was paid to bring a boy into the world. And when he saw the boy, he was beautiful. So he went to the lesbian couple, I will pay ten times what you gave me to get you pregnant. I want my son since I don't want him to grow up in this abominable way of life. He sued them to court, but agreement is agreement. If you sign agreement with Satan, you have to pay for it. Is that the type of life that God wants us to live? No. Apostle Paul saw all these types of immoralities among the early churches in Corinth. As we read in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 8 to 13, Chapter 18, or verses 18 to 20. On the contrary, you yourself wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Such we are some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, Amen. but you are justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable for me. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything, food 
is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not the immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Verses 18 to 20. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Yes. Verse 20. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Hallelujah! Yeah. The second commandment reads, Thou shalt not kill. The rich young man also assured Jesus that he had not killed anybody, but is it when we put knife in the neck of another, or bullet through the heart of another that murder is committed? Can we not kill with our tongue? And how many people have been committed suicide because of poisons we spit out of the sword of our mouth? The Bible also makes these realistic remarks about our tongue, which we can use either to save life or to destroy life. But the tongue can no man take. Read the Bible. This does not mean that it is never brought under control, but that it is impossible effectually and certainly to subdue it. It would be possible to subdue and domesticate any kind of beast, but this could not be done with the tongue. The Bible says, Our tongue is an unruly evil, an evil without restraint to which no certain and effectual check can be applied. Of the truth of this, no one can have any doubt who looks at the condition of the world full of deadly poison. That is, it acts on the happiness of man and on the peace of society. As poison does on the human frame, the allusion here seems to be to the bite of a venomous reptile. Compare Psalm 140, verse 3. They are sharpening their tongues like serpents. Others' poison is under their lips. Romans 3, verse 13. With their tongues, they have used the seed. The poison of asp is under their lips. Nothing will better describe the mischief that may be done by the tongue. There is no sting of a serpent that does so much evil in the world. There is no more poison than more deadly to the frame than the poison of the tongue is to the happiness of man. Who, for example, can stand before the power of the slanderer? What mischief can be done in society that can be compared with that which he may do? How many innocent people's reputations have been ruined for ridiculous reasons, without any justification whatsoever? When we are in a moment of doubt, fear, envy, or self-glorification, through the use of the tongue to assassinate others' characters and reputations which have been built over a lifetime. Our leaders used to say that if you ignorantly or mistakenly or mischievously naked an innocent fellow human being before the whole world, you can never find sufficient clothes to cover his nakedness. And that is why we must be careful at any point in time of our life never to be made an instrument of judgment against any brother or sister of ours. People can make mistakes. People can hear, and it's our responsibilities as believers, Christians, to help such people out of the pit, but not to sentence him or her, or condemn him or her to everlasting shame. We must realize that one day, we shall be held accountable for every word, every action, and every destructive thought we inflict on our fellow brothers and sisters. The third commandment reads, Thou must not steal. Thou must not defraud others. I believe these two are related somehow. When John the Baptist was calling the children of Israel to repentance in the wilderness, I was baptizing those who repented and believed. He said in Luke 3, 9-14, And now also the axe is laid upon the root of the tree. Every tree therefore which bringeth forth good fruit, but which does not bring good fruit is hewn down and cast into fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said unto them, He that had two coats, 
let it impact to him that had none. And he that had meat, let him do likewise. Then came also the publicans and said to him, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Is that no more than that which is appointed you? And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. His warning touched the hearts of most of his hearers as he should touch our hearts today. That we are on this planet earth only for a short time. Yes. Our own assignment as servants of the Most High is to convey God's commandments and warnings to you. It is up to you to accept the teaching and act on them or reject them. Amen. We cannot force you. But the Bible says that every tree which does not bring forth its fruit at its season will be healed down and cast into fire. Yes. Do not steal and do not covet what is not yours. Be contented with what you have. Well, because we want to be like the Joneses, we go out of our way to incur multiple debts on ourselves because we want to acquire all the luxuries of this world. And are not responsible enough to know that we have to pay back. We start making excuses and justifying our inability to give to God what belongs to God. And to man what belongs to man. For the man has a case against the inhabitants of the land. Because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follow bloodshed. Today we glorify in all these atrocities as if they have become old fashioned in our modern society. In verse 6, the Bible reads My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Apostle Paul gave us hope and guidance to those who needed knowledge. In Philippians 4, 10 to 11, it reads, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lack opportunity. Now that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble men, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And our Lord told the rich young man, Honor your father and mother. I have often been asked this puzzling question. Who is my father? Since Jesus also said, there is only one Father for us, and He is God. Yes, it is true. That God is our Supreme Father, and that is why our Lord referred to Him as our Father who are in heaven. Jesus did not say that we must never recognize our parents as father and mother, as the Holy Bible too does not refer to them as daddy and mommy, but father and mother. We read in the Ten Commandments, which Prophet Moses brought down from Mount Sinai, in Exodus 20, 12, and Deuteronomy 5, 16. Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be...